Welcome to the broadcast for the Notice of Funding Availability for the Fiscal Year 2015 Continuum of Care Program Competition and for HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs. My name is Norm Suchar and I'm the Director of the SNAPS Office. I'm joined today by SNAPS Program Specialists Tracy Turner and Diane Schmutzler. The purpose of this broadcast is to provide an overview of this year's NOFA and application process and provide you with the information that you will need to complete each part of the application. Today we'll discuss the following. We'll talk about the policy priorities, how the tiers will affect COCs and project applications, the selection criteria, we'll discuss what's new, and then we'll run through the project application, the COC application, the COC priority listing, We'll talk about UFAs and we'll conclude with helpful hints and reminders and leave you with some tools and resources to assist you as you complete the application. Let's get started. Next, we'll talk about the policy priorities. This list of policy priorities was introduced in the fiscal year 2015 COC program registration notice to give COC's collaborative applicants and project applicants the ability to review and locally prepare for the 2015 COC program competition. COCs and project applications submitted to HUD for the fiscal year 2015 COC program competition will be evaluated in part based on the extent to which they further HUD's goals based on these policy priorities. Using performance and outcome data, COCs should decide how to best use the resources available to end homelessness within their community, including COC and ESG program funds, state and local funds, public and assisted housing units, mainstream service resources, such as Medicaid and philanthropic efforts. Decisions about resource allocation should include several factors. COCs should conduct a comprehensive review of their COC projects using standardized uh, scoring tools to determine the extent to which each project is still necessary and addresses the policy priorities in this competition. Now, I want to be clear, this is not just about identifying lower performing projects, but this is to identify whether you have projects that could be reallocated uh, to a project that could help you better meet the priorities, uh, the policy priorities we've outlined. So another factor is you want to be maximizing the use of mainstream resources. COCs and project applicants should be ensuring that they are using all of the available mainstream resources to enhance supportive services and other activities in their projects. COCs should be looking to engage in partnerships with other stakeholders within their geographic area, including public housing agencies, philanthropic organizations, healthcare organizations, schools, employment organizations, and other agencies in an effort to better serve people experiencing homelessness. And I want to pay special attention to transitional housing. COCs should be working with their existing transitional housing recipients. They should be carefully reviewing their transitional housing projects for cost effectiveness, performance, and for the number and type of eligibility requirements that they have. We found that in many cases and for many populations, rapid rehousing is a better service model, although we recognize that transitional housing may be effective for certain populations, such as housing for underage homeless youth, uh, providing safety for, for people fleeing domestic violence, and for assistance in the recovery process. However, for those other population types, rapid rehousing may well be a better option. Next, let's talk about the priority for chronic homelessness. HUD encourages continuums of care to create new projects through reallocation or through a permanent housing bonus to exclusively serve people experiencing chronic homelessness, including individuals, youth, or families. Individuals and families experiencing chronically homel chronic homelessness should be given priority for any permanent supportive housing uh, that is not currently dedicated to this population as vacancies become available through turnover. This means that as participants successfully exit a PSH project, we encourage projects to use the new beds to house chronically homeless individuals and families. We also strongly encourage continuums and projects to not only review but also keep handy uh, the notice CPD 14012, as this document contains a lot of valuable information about how prioritization works, when it should be used, and what to do once your geographic area has significantly reduced the number of people experiencing chronic homelessness. Next, let's talk about ending family homelessness. 
Families experiencing homelessness can be housed quickly and stably using rapid rehousing. Most, if not all, COCs have affordable housing units and are encouraged to work with affordable housing pro providers to access those units for families experiencing homelessness. Permanent supportive housing and housing sub subsidies remain an important option for some families who have larger needs that require longer periods of assistance and, in some cases, intensive supportive services. Now let's talk about the needs of homeless youth. COCs should understand the unique needs of homeless youth and should be reaching out to youth-serving organizations to help them fully participate in the COC. COCs and youth-serving organizations should work together to develop resources and programs that better end youth homelessness and meet the unique needs of homeless youth, including LGBTQ youth. We strongly recommend that you review the information regarding the Homeless Youth Rapid Rehousing Model, which can be accessed by cl clicking on the link in this slide. Now let's talk about ending veterans' homelessness. Ending veterans' homelessness is within reach for many communities and COCs, and COCs should take the necessary steps to reach this goal. These steps can include using COC program-funded projects to the extent possible to prioritize veterans and their families who cannot be effectively assisted with other VA services. If it is determined that veterans and their families cannot effectively be assisted with VA funding and services and have the same level of needs as non-veterans, the COC can choose to make the veteran a priority, and we encourage you to do so. We want you to look at VA funding. COCs should work closely with the local VA and other veteran-serving organizations and coordinate COC resources with VA-funded housing and services. On July 13th, we send out a listserv message informing communities of a new HUD technical assistance initiative called Vets at Home. Any COC can receive technical assistance through this initiative. We'll be providing all COCs requesting TA through this initiative with remote technical assistance. Uh, and we'll, providing, we'll be providing other forms of technical assistance as well. The focus of this initiative is to assist continuums of care to put in place a system that can house every veteran experiencing homelessness and ensure that, veterans, uh, that homelessness among veterans is rare. Housing First is an approach to homeless assistance that prioritizes rapid placement and stabilization in permanent housing and does not have service participation requirements or preconditions such as sobriety or a minimum income threshold. Participation in supportive services should be based on the needs and desires of the program participant. We also recognize that there may be some instances where the Housing First approach is not appropriate for a project, but we encourage communities to use Housing First approaches whenever possible. Specific steps to support a community-wide Housing First approach include the following. COC should re review system and project level eligibility criteria to identify and remove barriers to accessing services and housing. Currently, many COC-funded projects have barriers to entry that should be reevaluated and in most case should, cases should be eliminated. Centralized or coordinated assessment systems. All COCs are required through the COC program interim rule to have an operating centralized or coordinated assessment system, also referred to as a coordinated entry system. Early this year, we released the coordinated entry policy brief which can be accessed via the link on this slide that provides additional information on this requirement for COCs and COC program funded projects. Coordinated entry is a key step in assessing the needs of homeless individuals and families requesting assistance and prioritizing those households for assistance. Another important factor is client-centered client service delivery. Housing and services should be tailored to meet the unique needs of each individual and family presenting for services. Program participants should not be required to participate in services that they believe will not help them achieve their goals. COCs should also prioritize those who are identified as most in need of services to be assisted with uh, uh, homeless assistance. This could include things like having been living on the street the longest, uh, households with children who are living unsheltered, people with medical vulnerabilities, uh, they should all be prioritized for placement in uh, uh, COC-funded housing. 
Inclusive decision making is also important. COC should be ensure that the needs of all individuals and families experiencing homelessness are represented within the COC structure by including providers serving groups such as persons fleeing domestic violence, LGBTQ uh, community, victims of human trafficking, unaccompanied youth, and other relevant populations in the COC planning process and COC planning bodies. This will ensure that service delivery is both client-centered and culturally competent. Next, we're going to talk about the Tier 1 and Tier 2 funding process. Although the available amount of funding is expected to be sufficient to fully fund all anticipated renewal projects in fiscal year 2015, HUD will continue to require collaborative applicants to rank all projects, except for the COC planning and UFA cost projects, and to rank those in two tiers. Tier 1 will be equal to 85% of the COC's fiscal year 2015 annual renewal demand approved by, the, by HUD on the final HUD-approved GIWs that were finalized either during the fiscal year 2015 registration process or the 10-day grace period after the NOFA was released. Tier 2 will be the difference between Tier 1 and the total amount that uh, COCs are allowed to apply for, which will include uh, eligible renewal projects and up to 15% uh, for uh, bonus projects, 15% of the final pro rata need. So in fiscal year 2015, COCs may apply for up to 15% uh, for a bonus project. As a reminder, the final pro rata need is the higher of the COC's annual renewal demand or preliminary pro rata need, or PPRN. New in fiscal year 2015, COCs do not have to consider where to rank COC planning and if they're UFA, UFA project costs. These projects are two types of projects that if they pass eligibility and threshold requirements, they can be conditionally selected uh, with funds set aside for these, uh, we've set aside funds for these two specific types of projects. To understand the total amount of funds available for each uh, COC, it is important to first determine each COC's annual renewal demand amount. A COC's annual re renewal demand is the sum of all projects eligible for renewal in fiscal year 2015 as established on the grant inventory worksheet. In fiscal year 2015, COCs are provided a 10-day grace period to make any final adjustments to their GAW after registration that could impact their total ARD. HUD will consider the final HUD approved GIW to be either the final version approved during the registration or, if applicable, the GIW approved by HUD during the 10 day grace period. HUD will publish a list with each COC's final annual renewal demand and Tier 1 amounts on the HUD exchange. HUD will not make any adjustments to a COC's ARD following this grace period. Although eligible renewal projects may still apply for funding in fiscal year 2015 if they were left off the COC's final HUD-approved GIW, the COC's ARD will not be adjusted, which means the project will likely impact the availability of funds for other projects that were included on the GIW. Next, I'm going to talk about the calculation of Tier 1. The first thing I want to mention is that the ARD and tiers are set before statutory updates to things like leasing operating costs and rental assistance. So those updates are based on FMR. Uh, tier 1 projects will be selected in the order of continuum of care score. I want to stress that we're confident that there's enough funding for, uh, to fund all of the projects in Tier 1. But COC should very carefully determine the priority and ranking for all their project applications, both in Tier 1 and in Tier 2. And I'll describe Tier 2 on this next slide. Now we'll talk about uh, the Tier 2 funding process. As I mentioned earlier, Tier 2 is the difference between Tier 1 and the total amount of uh, assistance a COC is eligible to get, which includes both the total amount of their annual renewal demand and the amount that's available for bonus, which is 15% of their final pro rata need. So the way we're going to do uh, Tier 2 projects is a little different than we've done it in the past. Tier 2 projects will receive a point value of up to 100 points. And the points will be based on the following four things. 60 points based on the COC application score, 20 points for how the COC ranks the project, 10 points for the type of project, and 10 points for whether they commit to using a housing first approach. 
uh, and I'll talk about those uh, in more detail in a minute. Uh, tier 2 projects will be selected by point value and in the order of COC score, and I'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. So let's go through the uh, Tier 2 uh, point values and uh, how we assess these. So 60 points will be available based on the COC application score, and that will be uh, just directly proportionate to the COC application score. So if the COC gets all 200 points available, they'll get 60 points. Uh, the project will get 60 points. If they get half the points, uh, 100 out of 200, uh, the project would get 30 out of 60 points. Uh, 20 points will be available based on the COC, how the COC ranks the project applications within Tier 2. I'm actually going to talk about this a little more in a minute. 10 points will be based on the type of project at, that's submitted. So 10 points will be available uh, for new and renewal permanent housing projects that are serving any populations uh, and renewal safe havens. Uh, for homeless management information system projects, and for supportive services only projects that are dedicated to centralized or coordinated assessment. 10 points will also be available for transitional housing projects that are exclusively serving homeless youth. Other transitional housing projects that are not exclusively serving homeless youth will receive three points, and supportive services only or SSO projects that are not for coordinated or centralized assessment will receive one point. 10 points will be available based on the uh, project committing to a housing first approach. And there are more details in the application about exactly what this means. HMIS and SSO projects uh, will just automatically receive 10 points. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is that uh, this year, uh, housing first does not just apply to permanent housing projects. It will also apply to transitional housing projects and SSO projects, except for ones that are for uh, coordinated entry. Next, I want to talk a little bit about uh, projects that straddle. So this has been, uh, uh, we've done this a couple different ways in past years. Uh, and so this year, we're doing it a little differently than we've done it in past years. So I want to talk about how we're doing it. So we are allowing projects to straddle Tier 1 and Tier 2 in this year's competition. And this is how we're going to handle it. The part of a project that is located in Tier 1, we will fund as if it were a Tier 1 project, uh, up to the amount of funding that falls within Tier 1. And then we'll rank the Tier 2 part of that project just as we would rank any other Tier 2 uh, project. And what will happen is if the Tier 2 part of that project is selected, then we'll award the project as one whole project with its full amount of funding. If the Tier 2 project is not awarded funding, it, it was too low, maybe it didn't get uh, enough points or whatever, didn't get awarded, then we will, we, will, uh, we will fund the project at its Tier 1 level, provided that the project is still feasible and can, uh, can serve uh, people experiencing homelessness effectively. So next, I want to talk a little bit about the 20 points uh, that I had mentioned earlier that is based on the, degree, the, the ranking that the COC provides to the project. So I have a relatively complicated chart up here. And so I want to walk through exactly how this works and what this means. So what the chart shows is essentially uh, a, 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 an example COC that has a tier one amount that is about a million dollars, which is denoted by the, uh, by the dotted line. And it has projects that are located above the uh, funding line and projects that are located below the funding line, including uh, what's called Project E, which straddles the funding line. So you can see Project D is completely located in Tier 1 and would be awarded as a Tier 1 project. Project E and, uh, uh, straddles the line. And so part of the project is in Tier 2. Uh, and part of the project is in Tier 1. And uh, projects F and G are uh, entirely located in Tier 2. So the way we would do this is what you can see is on the right is sort of a, a description of how much 
uh, funding each of these projects is requesting and where sort of where they fall on the tier two funding line. If you could imagine a, a sort of a funding line that starts at zero with the top project in tier one and just keeps, you keep adding uh, to the cumulative total as you add projects. And what we're doing is we are sort of placing these projects on this, uh, on this kind of a chart and we're taking the midpoint, the funding midpoint of each project and we are assigning that a point value. So basically if a COC ranks a project highly within tier two or if the uh, tier two portion of a project that straddles the line is in there, we will award more points to those because the, the funding midpoint as shown by this chart falls higher on the, the point values on the left. So if you have a small project that's tucked away at the top of tier two, uh, you'll get 20 points. Uh, it, you can see project F in the middle, uh, sort of in the middle there of tier two. Uh, you can see where the midpoint hits the funding line and it would uh, receive about 12 points. And you can see how project G is at the bottom of this. Uh, and there, the, its midpoint fu of funding would sort of hit the, the point score at uh, three points. So we realize this is a little complicated. Uh, I want to explain just briefly why we did it this way. We don't actually try to make things more complicated, but we were trying to find ways uh, to make, uh, to, to remove some of the weird incentives that we've seen in the past with respect to uh, straddling projects and with respect to how, uh, how COCs um, rank projects. We didn't want to have uh, just give 20 points to the highest ranked project in COC because that would create an incentive for uh, COC to create just one giant project in tier two to get all 20 points. Uh, and that would be, that would hurt uh, uh, COCs with a lot of uh, small projects in tier two because some of the bottom ones would have lower point values. So if you uh, just put one giant project in your tier two, uh, that project would receive 10 points. Uh, we understand that the, the tier one funding cutoff has been a big problem for people, so we're allowing uh, people to straddle, but we didn't want to create incentives where you'd put maybe 10% of a project in tier one and then a big amount in tier two uh, to, to take advantage of the tier one funding. So that's why we've, uh, we've sort of constructed the, the uh, funding process this way. So let's quickly recap the selection process. The selection process is different than past year's NOFA, so, pl NOFA, so please review uh, the NOFA very carefully to see both uh, the selection uh, process and to see how uh, uh, your COC application will be scored and how projects will be scored and how projects will be selected out of tier two. Again, the selection process for tier one and tier two are different as I've just discussed. Uh, and knowing the selection process is especially important uh, for you to understand how you should be ranking projects uh, and how you should be uh, 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 ranking projects with respect to policy priorities and to best uh, able your community to meet the goals of ending homelessness. Just as a quick overview of how we're, uh, uh, re how we're selecting projects, we will be selecting COC planning and UFA projects uh, first. So all those projects will be selected. They do not have to be ranked uh, in either tier one or tier two. Uh, we anticipate that we will have more than enough funding uh, to fund all the projects in tier one, uh, and we'll select those in order by COC, but again, we expect to be able to, uh, to fund all of the projects you place in tier one. Uh, and the tier two selection process, uh, I've just gone over that in some detail, but please review the NOFA very carefully uh, to understand exactly how the point values are assigned uh, and exactly how the selection process works. I want to talk a little bit about how missing a project on the grant inventory worksheet uh, can affect your COC. Uh, and part of the reason I want to describe this is because it, I just want to reiterate how important it is for your COC to work with every project in your community, every provider, to ensure that you're including every single project on your GIW and pay a special attention to this during the 10 day grace period. <clears throat> so we use the final HUD approved grant inventory worksheet to, to, to determine your final annual renewal demand. 
uh, as you can see, eligible renewal projects not included on a GIW can apply for assistance, but your ARD will not be increased to account for those. So eligible renewal projects not on the final HUD approved GIW uh, will be selected based on the tier which they're located in. If they're ranked in tier one, it will mean that you have to put more projects into tier two uh, to account for that, and that puts those projects at risk. So please uh, ensure that you've reviewed everything you have to uh, include all those projects that are eligible for renewal on your grant inventory worksheet. Uh, next, I want to quickly go over what's new for fiscal year 2015. So one of the new things is that we have a permanent housing bonus that is a little different than we've done it in past years. The, the permanent housing bonus will be up to 15% of a COC's final pro rata need. Uh, the permanent housing bonus can be used for permanent supportive housing that serves uh, people experiencing chronic homelessness, which include, can include uh, individuals, including youth, or families with children. Uh, it can also be used for rapid rehousing projects uh, that serve uh, individuals and families, including youth, uh, that are coming directly from the streets, from emergency shelter, or are fleeing domestic violence. You can also create projects through reallocation. Uh, pro types of projects you can create through reallocation are different than past years. They include permanent supportive housing for people experiencing chronic homelessness, which again can include individuals, families with children or youth. Uh, they can include rapid rehousing projects actually for any population type, uh, including individuals, uh, households with children and youth. Uh, you can reallocate to homeless management information systems projects, which is different from some past years, and you can also uh, reallocate to uh, supportive services only projects that are uh, for uh, coordinated entry. Now, in the last time we did the uh, allowing reallocation to an SSO project for coordinated entry, we only allowed reallocation from other SSO projects. In this case, you can reallocate from any type of project. Uh, one last thing I want to say about the permanent, uh, permanent housing bonus. Last year, there was sort of a special pool of funding for the permanent housing bonus. This year, there is not a sort of a separate special pool of funding. Uh, they will be ranked and reviewed uh, the same way as all other projects. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy, who will discuss the project application. Thank you, Norm. The project application process is conducted in eSNAPS, the online registration application and grants management system for HUD's COC programs. You can access eSNAPS via the HUD Exchange at www.hudexchange.info. Before creating the project application, project applicants need to assess the project applicant profile to either create the profile if you are a new project applicant or update the profile if you are a renewal project applicant. Project application in eSNAPS allows one, the grant applicants recipients to update the project applicant profile and the SF-424. The SF-424 must be completed in order to assess the project application in eSNAPS. Grant applicants recipients must provide documentation of applicant and subrecipient eligibility to apply for COC program funding, which includes nonprofit documentation, two certifications, a code of conduct, and the SFLLL, disclosure of lobbying, if it is applicable. The HUD 2880, which is the applicant recipient disclosure update report, which must include the correct amount of HUD assistance requested and dated between July 1st, 2015 and September 1st, 2015. The HUD 500 70, drug-free workplace, if the project applicant is submitting more than one project application. A HUD 570 must be completed for each project, project or the project applicant can complete one HUD 570 and list or attach all project locations. This form must also be dated between, between July 1st 2015 and September 1st, 2015. Applicants must use eSNAPS to apply for funding under the COC program. 
applicants must apply for funding for eligible renewal projects with ARD amounts that reflect the amounts in the fiscal year 2015 final HUD approved GIW. Applicants to request funding for new projects created through reallocation or permanent supportive housing bonus. COC planning costs and projects are new every year and calculated based on 3% of the final prorater need or $1,250,000, whichever is less. If HUD designates a collaborative applicant as a unified funding agency, better known as a UFA, this UFA designation is only effective for one year. This means that if HUD designated a collaborative applicant as a UFA in fiscal year 2014, COC program funding process and the collaborative applicant desires to remain a UFA, it was required to reapply for UFA designation in fiscal year 2015 COC program registration process. If HUD designates the collaborative applicant as a UFA in the fiscal year 2015 COC program competition, the collaborative applicant must also reapply for UFA costs. For those collaborative applicants that were designated as UFA, eSNAPs automatically calculated the UFA costs available, which will be 1.5% or $500,000, whichever is less of the COC's final pro rata need. Project application to eSNAPs allows eligible renewal projects to request funding for one. Applicants apply for funding for eligible renewal projects with annual renewal amounts, better known as ARA, which reflect the amounts in the fiscal year 2015 final HUD approved GIW and do not increase the overall approved ARD. Applicants requesting first-time renewals of Shelter Plus Care may request the number of units under lease at the time of GIW approval, regardless of whether the number of units exceed the number stated in the original grant agreement. In order to exceed the number of units stated in the original grant agreement, HUD required applicants to provide copies of the leases at GIW approval. If the applicant failed to provide the leases at GIW approval, the HUD, HUD will limit the maximum number of units to the HUD approved GIW. This means that HUD will award renewals based on the number of units in the HUD approved GIW. Applicants requesting first time renewals of Shelter Plus Care projects originally awarded for five years must calculate one year renewal funding at current FMR plus 7% admin costs. Any COC program, SHP or Shelter Plus Care grant awarded in a preceding competition that expires in calendar year 2016, January 1st to December 31st of 2016, or any renewal project currently in operation with an expiration date in calendar year 2016, which includes January 1st, 2016 through December 31st, 2016. And any Shelter Plus Care awarded prior to fiscal year 2002, for which funding is expected to run out in calendar year 2016 and has never applied for renewal funding. And finally, fiscal year 2009, project funds will no longer be available after September 30th of 2016. And LOCKS requires that all drawdowns be made by September 22nd of 2016. The project application to eSNAPS allows applicants with eligible renewal projects to request one year grant terms and one year renewal of funding. The one year funding will be grayed out because it is the only allowable funding term for renewals, applicants, and they cannot change that term. Any project-based rental assistance or project that has operating costs may request up to a 15-year grant term. However, the applicant may only request one year of funding. Funding for the remainder of the term is subject to availability, and applicants must apply for additional funds at such time and in the manner in which HUD may require. The new project application in eSNAPS only allows the following projects to be created through reallocation. PHPSH for 100% chronically homeless individuals and families. 
P-H-R-R-H, for individuals, families, with children, homeless, unaccompanied youth who come directly from the streets, and persons fleeing domestic violence, sexual assault, dating violence, and stalking. Dedicated HMIS that must be submitted by the HMIS lead, and dedicated SSO for coordinated entry. Permanent supportive housing projects must serve program participants who are 100% chronic, chronically homeless. Rapid rehousing projects created through reallocation can only serve individuals, families with children, and homeless unaccompanied youth who come directly from the streets, emergency shelters, or are persons fleeing domestic violence. COC planning cost grants are new for each competition and they are calculated based on 3% or $1,250,000, whichever is less of the final pro rata need. The COC planning costs were automatically calculated in eSNAP's registration based on the final pro rata need. For collaborative applicants that HUD designates as UFAs, this designation is for only one year. If HUD designated a collaborative applicant as a UFA in fiscal year 2014, COC program funding process, and the collaborative applicant desired to be a UFA for fiscal year 2015, the collaborative applicant must have applied and been approved by HUD for UFA designation during the fiscal year 2015 registration process. Collaborative applicants designated as UFAs must apply for the UFA costs in each competition. For those collaborative applicants approved for UFA designation, eSNAPs will automatically calculate the UFA costs available, which will be 1.5% or $500,000, whichever is less of the COC's FPRN. Now we're going to talk about bonus projects. New bonus project applications may be submitted for PSH for chronically homeless and RRH for individuals and or families with children. The proposed program participants must be homeless, coming from the streets, emergency shelters, or places not meant for human habitation. Permanent supportive housing projects must serve 100% chronically homeless program participants. The projects that serve these applicants, you are already accustomed to requesting funding for this project type. Rapid rehousing projects may request funding to serve homeless individuals, families with children, homeless unaccompanied youth, and persons fleeing domestic violence. The same rules for the PHRRH rules apply that pertain to PHRRH in reallocation. The individuals, families with children, and homeless unaccompanied youth can only enter this type of project directly from the streets or emergency shelters. Persons fleeing domestic violence can also be served by a new PHRRH project. In previous competitions, HUD restricted fiscal year 2008 rapid rehousing demo projects to remain TH with leasing. HUD will post an FAQ specifically for the 23 project applicants that are operating the rapid rehousing demo projects. A listserv message will be released when the FAQ is available. As mentioned by Norm in the NOFAS portion of this presentation, all project applications will receive a score that would then determine the projects that will be condi conditionally selected in Tier 2. Therefore, all project applications, including renewal project applications, have either additional questions added or existing questions expanded to capture information needed for the scoring process. This will provide uniform assessment of some key HUD objectives, such as reducing barriers to housing and prioritization, using the housing first approach and dedicated chronically homeless units and beds. HUD will be applying greater emphasis on capacity, project el eligibility and timeliness such as APR submissions, drawdowns from ELOCs, monitoring findings, and performance standards. 
We will now discuss match and leverage to provide further clarification of these funding sources that are not associated with the actual grant request. Number one, match and leverage is applicable to all component types. Match may be cash, in-kind, or a combination of both, and these funds must be used for COC program eligible costs as set forth in subpart D of the 24 CFR 578. Match is required for all project types except for leasing. A minimum of 25% match must be submitted for all applicable project and component types. Match and leverage commitment letters should be attached to the project application. HUD would not go to grant agreement on conditionally awarded projects until match documentation has been provided to the field office and the applicant has uploaded match documentation in eSNAPS during the post-award and technical submission process. HUD will only give credit for leverage where amounts are attached to the project application. Match and leverage funding may be from the same entity, but should be distinct contributions. This means, for example, a $50,000 contribution for match cannot also be counted as a $50,000 contribution for leverage. We will now point out a few things to remember. All eligible renewal projects must have been listed on the HUD-approved GIW. If the collaborative applicant failed to include any eligible renewal project on the HUD-approved GIW, the COC may include that project in its renewal request. However, HUD would not increase the ARD to accommodate the additional requested projects. In such cases, the COC must make critical decisions on ranking of the projects. Projects requesting funding must serve the program participants in accordance with the selected component type. For example, PHPSH projects must serve individuals or families with at least one person who has a qualifying disability and are chronically homeless. SSO and HMIS projects do not provide housing to program participants and therefore will not have access to the housing related questions in the project application. HUD reserves the right to reduce or reject a funded request based upon audit findings, history of inadequate financial management, untimely expenditures on prior awards, etc. This, this concludes the discussion on project application. Diane will now discuss the COC application. Thank you, Tracy. My name is Diane Schmutzler. I am a SNAPS specialist in the Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, known as SNAPS. And in this portion of the broadcast, I'm going to provide you a broad overview of the fiscal year 2015 COC application. First, I'll provide basic, big picture information about the COC application. And then I'll point out some important scoring considerations for this year's COC application and explain some of the major changes from the fiscal years 2013 and 2014 COC application. Finally, I will go over some of the technical highlights and policy priorities contained in this year's COC application. We hope you find this broadcast to be a useful tool as you begin the application process. To begin, the approved collaborative applicant must submit the COC consolidated application on behalf of the COC. As a reminder, the COC application is just one of two submissions required from the collaborative applicant. The other submission is the COC priority listing, which we will discuss later in this broadcast. It is worth emphasizing that the COCs must remember that the COC application and the COC priority listing are separate submissions in eSNAPS. Therefore, collaborative applicants must ensure that both the COC application and the COC priority listing with all of the project applications either approved or ranked or rejected are submitted in eSNAPS prior to the application submission deadline. This year's COC application is based on a scale of 200 points with an additional three bonus points possible 
and it is very important that COCs review the COC application carefully and pay very close attention to the COC application detailed instructions as these provide thorough guidance and useful summaries of reference documents and attachments required to complete the COC application. You'll see in, fiscal year 2015, in the fiscal year 2015 COC program competition NOFA that the scoring of the COC application is divided into seven major sections summarized in this slide. Today I will not discuss each of these sections in depth, but simply will emphasize the point structure of this year's competition. Again, the COC application will be scored on a 200 point scale and you can see that the majority of points will be awarded in three categories. First, the most points are available in the performance and strategic planning section. There are 60 points, a full 30% of the application, available for demonstrating that your COC is effectively working to end homelessness for the four populations outlined in the publication, Opening Doors Federal Strategic Plan to Prevent and End Homelessness which was recently amended in 2015. These populations are veterans, people experiencing chronic homelessness, families, and youth. Because these populations represent a significant portion of the COC application score, I will walk through these areas in more detail later in the broadcast. The next largest section, with approximately 25% of the points, is the COC coordination and engagement section, where COCs must demonstrate coordination and engagement with key stakeholders and organizations in the community, as well as ConPlan and ESG jurisdictions. Finally, with almost 20% of the points, the systems performance section is where COCs will demonstrate the COC's system level performance. It is important to understand that this section differs significantly from past years because of the shift from project level performance to relying on the new system performance measures. Nevertheless, the performance measure concepts that are present in this section should still be familiar to you. As in past competitions, there are also points available for project ranking review and capacity, HMIS, and the point in time count. While these areas, as they're divided in the program NOFA, carry less weight for the scoring of the COC application this year, that in no way diminishes their importance for the COC processes. In fact, COCs must have solid HMIS and point in time count procedures in order to score well on the system performance measures. And in turn, solid performance measures will contribute to the objective criteria needed to assess project capacity, make funding decisions, and ultimately to review and rank projects. New this year, HUD will award three bonus points to COCs that submit their application early. COCs should reference the fiscal year 2015 COC program competition NOFA for exact information on when they must be submit, be, submit their application to earn these bonus points. Now, let's walk through some of the broad changes to the fiscal year 2015 application. But before I dig into the actual changes, you may have already observed that the COC application looks, feels, and functions differently than in recent years. You will undoubtedly recognize familiar questions, and certainly the concepts have remained consistent according to statutory requirements and policy priorities, but SNAPS has been cognizant of making the COC application a useful tool and a resource for COCs. Therefore, the fiscal year 2015 COC application not only provides the more objective information that HUD needs for competitive scoring purposes, but we hope that it will also help COCs to better evaluate and manage their projects, improve their relationships with key partners in the community, and address the strategic use of resources in the COC's projects to ultimately bring us closer to achieving the goal of ending homelessness. So first, let's talk about the structure of the COC application questions. In general, and you'll see laid out in the slide, you'll see two significant changes to the structure of the COC application. The first is that the COC application is actually much shorter than last year, and the questions are arranged in a more cohesive flow, both in the application and in relation to the NOFA. So it should be easier to understand and follow the concepts. You will also notice a shift from a reliance on narrative-based responses 
to a greater reliance on data-driven charts, drop-down menus, and checkboxes. This change signals HUD's increasing focus on performance and outcomes, plus a continued effort to streamline the COC application into more quantifiable, objective criteria for evaluation. HUD expects that the basic COC governance is in place, and while we continue to score on a number of elements related to COC governance and process, you will see that the application continues to turn more towards performance-based outcomes and on COCs being increasingly equipped to engage the broader community in the effort to end homelessness. Nevertheless, this year you will continue to see narrative responses in the systems performance sections, and this is because we are in the process of moving from project-level performance to system-level performance, and we know that your HMIS is not yet programmed to report on all of the new system-level performance measures. So for those measures where HUD does not expect your HMIS to be able to produce a report yet, we have asked for more qualitative responses. Now, over the course of the next year, HUD expects your systems to be programmed so you can anticipate reporting on the full package of system level performance measures in the future. While we do not expect all the measures to be reported on numerically for this year's COC application, we do expect that COCs will respond to performance questions with the entire system in mind. Additional differences this year relate to how HUD will critically evaluate projects. These changes are the result of the overall COC application score having a stronger effect on which COCs will receive funding for their Tier 2 ranked projects. So it is very important for COCs to understand how they should approach project review, ranking, and selection in the COC. In the previous slide, we emphasized system level performance, yet project level performance is very important as well. And the fiscal year 2015 COC application emphasizes just how important it is that the COC review project performance in their, their review, ranking, and selection process. When COCs review their per performance in their projects, HUD expects that COCs are using project APRs to systematically review performance across projects, and you will see this emphasis reflected in a new question about APR review. Given that COCs are increasingly evaluated on performance data, it benefits COCs to rely on project performance in deciding which projects will be ranked in Tier 1 and Tier 2. And this will strengthen the overall COC's performance while ensuring that the most effective projects continue to receive funding and thus contribute to the larger effort of ending homelessness in your COC. Along with performance, HUD expects that COCs are thinking deeply about how to most strategically use their limited resources. That includes making sure that projects are serving the people who are in the hardest to serve, who are the hardest to serve in the community. Those who have been on the street the longest or who have significant service needs or who are highly vulnerable. In the COC application, you'll see this concept emphasized in a series of questions that are designed to evaluate how communities are using their resources strategically. In three of these cases, the COCs will need to review, collect, and condense information submitted in their project applications in order to answer the question in the COC application. These strategies collectively ensure that the people who need our resources most are getting them. This means that providers are screening people into services, not out of them. In the COC applications, COCs will need to review their project applications to assess which projects have reduced barriers to program participation. Barriers which may include, but are not limited to, requiring minimum income or a clean criminal record. And this process will help the COC be more aware of where those barriers continue to exist. Those barriers these barriers prevent providers from serving the people who are most desperately in need of the housing and services they provide. In addition, this year by answering the low barrier questions in the project application, projects will also be more accurately identified as adopting a housing first approach. The COC in turn will need to be aware of and report on the projects that have adopted a housing first approach, similar to the fiscal years 2000 and 2013 and 2014 COC application. In the project review, ranking, and selection, along with project performance, 
HUD also expects that COCs are taking into account the severity of needs and vulnerabilities of the people the project serves when determining project priority. In the COC application, there are questions about whether the COC has adopted the order of prioritization for PSH units that are laid out in HUD's notice CPD 14012, the factors that the COC will use in the coming year to prioritize resources for households with children and for unaccompanied youth, and how the COC is prioritizing veterans who are ineligible for VA healthcare services. This year, COCs will see an enhanced emphasis on building key relationships in our efforts to end homelessness. The fiscal year 2015 COC application focuses more heavily on youth service providers and victim service providers, regardless of their source of funding, as recognition of the importance of integrating these service providers into the COC planning and decision making for these populations. The COC application also focuses in a more concrete way on how COCs coordinate with CONPLAN and ESG jurisdictions in their geographic area, and asks specifically about the percentage of overlapping jurisdictions with whom the COC coordinates, as recognition of the importance of these relationships in informing CONPLANs and planning and evaluating the use of ESG funds. To help COCs respond to this question, HUD has prepared a document titled COC Con Plan Jurisdiction and ESG Recipient Crosswalk. And that document shows all of the Con Plan jurisdictions and ESG recipients within the COC's geography. So while the format and presentation of those, these questions are new, the substance of the questions should be familiar to the COCs. And the document I reference can be found on the HUD exchange. Now, as a new question, HUD is asking COCs to report on their coordinated efforts in working with public housing agencies in their geographic area in serving homeless households. PHAs hold extremely valuable resources for ending homelessness for households, especially families. The COC will have to coordinate with the PHAs to answer this question, and we hope that this will be an easy exercise for COCs that are already working with PHAs. In other cases, this may re represent an opportunity for the COC to bring unengaged PHAs into this important conversation about how they can better use their resources to serve homeless households. Finally, one unchanged element that represents the importance of building key relationships to end homelessness is the continued focus on the importance of relationships with VA-funded partners like VA medical centers and SFVF providers in ending veterans' homelessness. Ultimately, the ability of a community to leverage mainstream housing resources is absolutely essential to end homelessness, and the fiscal year 2015 COC application demonstrates a stronger emphasis on building key relationships within the community to help meet that goal. So far, I have covered the broad conceptual changes to the application. Now I'll take some time to highlight some technical changes and elements. Earlier, I mentioned the importance of COCs having solid HMIS and point-in-time count procedures, and that while these sections of the fiscal year 2015 COC application appear smaller in the application, they still have a significant effect on system performance measures and the COC's subsequent ability to assess project capacity, make funding decisions, and ultimately review and rank projects. Speaking to the importance of good data collection and quality, this year's COC application has a revamped HMIS section with fewer questions and increased emphasis on HMIS data quality. You can see from the NOFA that within the HMIS and PIT sections, there are more questions dedicated, more points dedicated to questions that are related to the quality of the COC's data. Therefore, with more emphasis on data-driven responses, COCs will rely on a number of data sources. First, as I stated earlier in this broadcast, there are a number of COC application questions where COCs will need to rely on project applications, since individual projects were required to answer each of these questions as part of their application process. These three areas cover the percentage of projects adopting a housing first approach, the percentage of projects that are low barrier, and the percentage of PSH units that are prioritized for people experiencing chronic homelessness. 
The COC application detailed instructions prevent, present a clear summary table of the COC application questions that rely on the project applications. Next, to review, rank, and select projects in the fiscal year 2015 COC program competitions, COC will rely on objective criteria that can be gathered from APRs, monitoring reports, and other available data on projects. COCs will also see that there are a number of questions about rapid rehousing and PSH that rely on the HIC data being up to date and accurate. The point in time is another perennial data source required for determining changes in the total number of persons who are homeless and will also be referenced for the populations and subpopulations this year. HMIS is another important data source for many of the questions. This year, there's a new question on the number of youth served from unsheltered situations, which will require COCs to rely on HMIS. Finally, the question on PHAs serving homeless households will require COCs to get data from PHAs who have their own data systems to track those numbers. Now, I'm gonna shift the conversation and we're gonna focus on the policy priorities of ending homelessness among the key populations and subpopulations that are identified in the performance and strategic planning section of the fiscal year 2015 COC application, but also covered in other questions throughout the application. The objectives presented in the fiscal year 2015 COC application were derived from the recently amended Opening Doors Federal Strategic Plan to Prevent and End Homelessness document, which presents the vision that no one should experience homelessness, no one should be without a safe, stable place to call home, and it sets researched and realistic goals for reducing and ending homelessness. In this section, the COCs must explain their plans for and progress towards reducing homelessness within its geographic area among youth, households with children, veterans, and persons experiencing chronic homelessness. As you can see in the NOFA, HUD has devoted 60 points to population-specific questions, and these points are equally divided between the four populations. The national goals are as follows. End homelessness for families, youth, and children in 2020, end chronic homelessness in 2017, and end homelessness among veterans in 2015. First, let's address homeless youth. The national goal is to end homelessness for youth in the next five years, in 2020. In recent competitions, HUD has not been as diligent in focusing on homeless youth compared to some of our other priority populations. But this year's COCs will see a set of questions related to youth homelessness that highlight the policies and strategies that are essential to ending youth homelessness. Youth have unique needs and vulnerabilities, and communities have to develop youth-specific strategies that address the exploitation and vulnerabilities that youth face as well as provide for the unique housing needs of youth. As with all of the targeted population, HUD expects that communities will prioritize the youth who are hardest to serve, which could mean changing providers' entry requirements and restrictions. Again, we should not be screening in, or we should be screening in, not screening out. One great resource for COCs is to engage youth providers, since they have the expertise and understanding of what homeless youth are experiencing. Communities should look to youth providers and homeless youth as they strengthen their housing and service systems and make the changes necessary to accommodate the needs of youth. Now new this year, the new this fiscal year 2015 in the COC application, we require COCs to identify their strategies for identifying and addressing the unique housing and service needs of unaccompanied homeless youth, including addressing their strategies for homeless youth that are victim of human trafficking and other forms of exploitation. Similar to last year, COCs must also demonstrate how they coordinate with local education authorities and school districts in their geographic area to identify individuals and families who become or remain homeless and inform them of their eligibility for educational services covered by the McKinney-Vento Act. And two, to ensure that all, all children are enrolled in early childhood programs and school. COCs must also 
more clearly demonstrate and then explain how they collaborate with McKinney-Vento local education liaisons and state education liaisons. In logical progression, the national goal to end homelessness for households with children in the, is in the next five years, or 2020. As we continue our work ending homelessness for households with children in 2020, HUD is con constantly looking for the most effective interventions that communities can implement and build upon. In terms of housing resources, communities should focus on rehousing households with children as rapidly as possible and bringing in mainstream housing organizations in that effort, as reflected by the question on PHA serving homeless households in the coordination section of the COC application. Rapid rehousing also plays an important role in getting households with children back into housing quickly. As we discussed already, COCs have to focus on screening households with family into housing and services rather than screening them out. That includes preventing involuntary separation of families as a precondition of receiving housing and services. We also have to make sure that children in these families are getting educated and that they have supports within the education system. Next up is the national goal to end chronic homelessness in 2017. In the fiscal year 2015 COC application, COCs are expected to consider their project applications commitment to increasing the number of prioritized and dedicated PSH beds for chronically homeless individuals and families that are made available through turnover. In addition, HUD encourages COCs to create new projects that exclusively serve chronically homeless individuals and families either through the reallocation process to create new projects or by applying for a permanent housing bonus project specifically for chronically homeless individuals and families. COCs are expected to be familiar with the notice CPD 14012, prioritizing persons experiencing chronic homelessness in permanent supportive housing and record keeping requirements for documenting chronic homeless status and will be scored on whether they have adopted the orders of priority set forth in that notice. Finally, COCs will pre be presented with the two-year plan for increasing PSH beds available for the chronically homeless that they presented to HUD in the fiscal year 2013, fiscal year 2014 COC application. And COCs will be asked to identify and explain each strategy and action item that has been accomplished from that two-year plan. Finally, we'll cover the national goal to end homelessness among veterans by the end of 2015. The good news is that ending veterans homelessness is within reach for many communities. COCs can take specific steps to reach this goal of decreasing the number of homeless veterans, and the COC application asks COCs to demonstrate the change in the number of homeless veterans in the COC's geographic area in 2015 compared to 2014 and 2010. As we move closer to the goal of ending veteran homelessness, it is especially important that veterans unable to access VA services are served by our COC resources. HUD will assess COCs based on the extent to which they identify assess and refer homeless veterans who are eligible for Veterans Affairs Services and housing, service and housing to appropriate resources such as HUD-VASH and SFVF. In addition, COCs must demonstrate how they are prioritizing COC program funded resources to serve veterans who are not eligible for homeless assistance through the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs programs. This concludes this portion of the broadcast covering the COC application. Tracy is now going to walk you through the fiscal year 2015 priority listing. We're now going to discuss the COC priority listing. The reallocation forms have permanently moved to the COC priority listing. Here, the collaborative applicant will indicate whether it is reallocating eligible renewal projects through either elimination or reduction to create the following types of new projects. PHPSH for 100% chronically homeless. PHRRH, dedicated HMIS, dedicated SSO for coordinated entry. There are four project listings. New, renewal, UFA costs, and COC planning. The listings need to include all new and renewal project applications approved by the COC 
in ranking order. The CUC assigns each new and renewal project a unique rank number. UFA costs and CUC planning projects are not ranked because they are new each and every year. The following attachments also are required with the priority listing. The HUD 2991, Certification of Consistency with a Consolidated Plan. It must have a current date and must be signed by the authorized official for the con plan jurisdiction. Final HUD approved grant inventory worksheet approved during the fiscal year 2015 COC program registration process or approved during the 10-day grace period after the fiscal year 2015 COC program competition NOFA was posted. Now I will briefly describe the appeals process. There are four types of appeals. Solo applicant appeals are when a project applicant feels they were denied the right to participate in the COC's process in a reasonable manner. They receive rejection notification in writing from the COC outside of eSNAPS. The full requirements for submitting a solo application are in eSNAPS. Once the competition closes, the solo applicant is required to submit evidence to support the appeal. They will, support, they will send that evidence to snapsappeal at hud.gov. I want to make an emphasis right here, though, that they should not send their appeals to their desk officer at headquarters or to the field office. The COC then has to respond by submitting their info to snapsappeals at hud.gov. HUD reviews both and makes a decision and then notifies the solo applicant and the COC of the decision. Denied and decreased appeals are only available to project applicants that were ranked within the COC's maximum amount available. They must submit a written appeal to HUD, must provide a copy to the authorized representative from the COC's designated collaborative applicant, and must also include evidence demonstrating HUD error. Consolidate, consolidated plan and certification appeal is when a jurisdiction refuses to provide a signed HUD 2991 for a project applicant. There are no competing COCs in the fiscal year 2015 COC program competition, so we do not need to discuss that appeal. The NOFA contains all of the details regarding the various appeals, what is eligible, and how and when you can go about appealing one of these areas. And just a few helpful hints and reminders. COC applicants are expected to read the COC program interim rule and NOFA thoroughly prior to completing the COC application for homeless assistance. It is important for each COC and each project applicant to treat each year's application as a new endeavor. While your project or the work of the COC is continuing, it is important that you fully describe what the COC and project application is doing as it relates to these questions. We will now just briefly discuss some tools and resources. As you move forward with your application, please remember the following resources are available for assistance. The HUD Exchange contains the eSNAPS AAQ uh, desk, which is www.hudexchange.info. It also has the application instructional guides, detailed instructions, and frequently asked questions. We will post this broadcast and the slides for your reference. If you are not signed up for the COC listserv messages, please do so. We distribute all of the pertinent program information via the listserv. You run the risk of missing out on important information and updates if you are not signed up. This concludes our broadcast today. On behalf of all of us at SNAPS, we thank you for your time and attention.